Um, so in the 18th century, the main scientific difference between a plant and an animal was that an animal could feel while a plant could not. Um, this, this definition had been codified by Carl Linnaeus, but was widely used by many naturalists in the 18th century. What slightly complicates this, um, it does work fine for lots of species, but of course there are lots of examples of animals who don't appear to have any sensation, things like sponges or corals or even some shellfish. And on the flip side, there are examples of things that look and act like plants most of the time, but that do seem to exhibit sensation. Uh, the Venus flytrap is a really nice example of this in the 18th century, but also plants like the sundew or the mimosa. So these things, the, the Venus flytrap, the mimosa, the sundew, they have plant, they have roots, they have leaves, they look a lot like regular plants, they're mostly green, but they also seem to have some kind of animal-like ability to move or to react or to digest food. So these kinds of examples, which became known to European scientists in the late 18th century, really complicated the old, older definition of what was a plant and what was an animal. Well, this was the, um, uh, an endemic um, carnivorous plant growing in the, in the bogs of Carolina um, that was uh, first made, uh, made aware to Europeans in the um, early 18th century. Um, and uh, they thought it was a great curiosity and um, uh, specimens of it were, were sent back to Europe. Um, not many of them lived to start with, but eventually they managed to get some, some growing. Um, and it was the first item of um, fascination about it, obviously, was its sensitivity. Um, sensitivity being one of the key concepts of um, around which biological thought was organised. Um, and also the speed of its um, reaction. Um, Venus flytraps can, can snap upon an insect, you know, in a matter of, of, of seconds, literally. Um, it's slightly more complicated than that, but we might get to that. Um, and it, it, was, it was these two things, um, one philosophical, the other um, an engineering question, in, in a sense, that fascinated people in Europe when this plant began to um, be examined. Um, it, it was certainly, to use my earlier word, transgressive, in that according to the conventional ideas, um, many of them based on the idea of the great chain of being, um, organisms lower in the hierarchy, like plants, insects, etc., um, couldn't eat, to put it crudely, organisms higher up, like animals and birds. And the thought that there was here um, a plant which ate animals um, was, was very, very worrying. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that it wasn't worrying enough to be dismissed, um, but thought to be challenging instead. And so people wanted to know how, what it was um, that enabled this plant to do um, a thing which plants weren't supposed to be able to do. I think, I think the hegemony of the, um, the Great Chain idea was breaking down a lot amongst scientists at that time, except amongst a uh, you know, few of the more sedate sort. Um, the mechanical question um, was how on earth it did it. You know, what was the mechanism by which um, a wriggling insect um, uh, set off this profoundly muscular action? In, in the plant, um, and that was the um, the thing, the the theme which began to be pursued. Um, and uh, to start with, the, 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 there were all kinds of beliefs about why it did it. Um, I think um, I think am I right in saying that Erasmus thought that. Um, it, it caught the insects to, to protect the, the flower, um, which was a, an ingenious and far from implausible explanation. Um, you find mechanisms like that in the orchid family, where um, 
uh, one part of the orchid will, will um, deter predatory insects in order to protect the insects going in uh, to do the pollination. Um, so that, that, that was one thing. And it was um, at, 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 at a lecture in, in Edinburgh um, that the question was asked um, about whether the plant might gain anything um, more, I mean, something more substantial by its capture and then evident digestion of the fly. And this, this, this wasn't noticed uh, early on, apparently. I think, I think they thought um, the flies were simply kind of fermenting inside rather than actually being, being uh, digested and used by the plant. And of course it was Erasmus's uh, grandson uh, in his really quite beautiful series of experiments um, who you know, began to decode precisely what was going on. And it was a wonderful story. The Venus flycrap first came to Europe in the 1760s. It grew in the swamplands of the Carolinas, and obviously local inhabitants had known about it for an awfully long time, but Europeans first noticed it in the mid-18th century. In the 1760s, two English botanists called John Bartram and William Young heard rumours about this plant, and they decided to visit the Carolinas to see if they could see it in its native habitat. Both of these people were employed by the British monarchy, and their job was to document the plant life of North America, and to send seeds and specimens back to Kew Gardens, which was just outside London. So each of these two men, Bartram and Young, travelled to the Carol Carolinas from their base in Phil Philadelphia. They travelled separately because they didn't get on so well. Uh, once, once they got there, they both saw the Venus flytrap in action. They saw, um, they saw it sitting quietly in the swamp, having a fly land on it and just snapping its jaws closed. This was something that no European had seen before, or at least any handful, and no one had ever scientifically described it before. So, of course, they wanted to get specimens back to Kew Gardens in London. That was their job. But getting live specimens across the Atlantic was quite a difficult task at this time. A seed passage could take an awfully long time. Conditions could be terribly rough. And some plants, like the Venus flytrap, needed to live in a certain amount of warmth and needed a certain amount of moisture that was quite difficult to control at sea. Uh, initially, Bartram and Young sent dead, dried specimens to Europe. But eventually, William Young crossed the Atlantic himself with a box of live specimens. Bringing live European, bringing live Venus flytraps to Europe for the first time, so that Europeans could see these in action. They were an instant hit in all of the salons of Europe. Everyone wanted one. All of the natural natural historians and all of the botanic gardens wanted to get their hands on these, and they entered pop culture very quickly with people writing poems and essays and uh, songs about them. Uh, they were an immensely popular route into natural history for ordinary people. So the Venus flytrap is a plant that breaks a lot of rules. In the 18th century, as naturalists understood it, plants had leaves and stems and roots, but they didn't have mouths and they couldn't trap prey and they couldn't eat their prey. Uh, this was quite a, a, a long-standing definition of what it was to be a plant. Suddenly, in the second half of the 18th century, natural history, European natural history, discovered these strange plants that did have mouths, and of course that made people rethink their definition of what a plant was. Um, one big question at the time was, could the plants really feel? So was it just some kind of mechanical reaction that made the mouth of the plant snap shut? Or were the plants sort of cognizant of their surroundings and aware the flies were landing on, on them and desirous of eating those flies? So natural history at this time was in a state of flux. People were breaking down the old boundaries about what it was to be a plant, what it was to be an animal, and that kind of clear-cut definition that put plants on one side and animals on the other. So now a lot of natural history thinking was being re-evaluated at this time. It was basically impossible to make something like a Venus flytrap fit into the standard European classification system, such as the Linnaean classification system, because it's just such an odd plant. So the Venus flytrap really made people question whether the natural world was neatly divided into just three kingdoms or whether nature might be quite a lot messier than previously thought and whether they might have to abandon those carefully constructed classification systems that had been of use to them for so long. Well, the, the, the etymology of the name, I mean, is, is, um, is deeply fascinating because um, 
and this I owe all this to uh, McKinley, who did all the the early work on um, tracking this down um, in in the nineteen nineties and um, very late. Nobody asked any questions about the name before. They took it. They took it on trust that this was a, uh, a Native American word. Um, uh, and when McKinley began to look into it, he he couldn't find any um, reference to this word in any um, Native American languages. Um, even though I was able to find one very close to it, um, and uh, I don't know if that was significant. But McKinley's theory, which um, I, I I find very plausible. Um, but his huge fun um, was that um, he, w what he then did was not investigate the uh, the name in the um, indigenous languages, but in the languages of the people who were um, having fun with the plant and talking about it. You know, to wit, uh, the English um, intellectual elite. Um, and he began looking through English slang dictionaries and some North American. Um, English dictionaries as well, and he found that um, a, a tippet meant a furry collar um, or anything like that. Um, a witchet was also um, uh, could be used for a for a noose, um, and he began to arrive at the uh, theory that um, the the name tippity witchet, which was first coined by one of the Bartrams, I think, um, or for first transmitted, um, um, in fact, probably coined, um, was, re were, was, a, was a sexual reference, and he was referring to a vaginal um, image, um, you know, the, the, the moist, palpy membranes of the, of the Venus flytrap's um, uh, leaves, um, and the fringe of, of, of spiky hairs uh, is a perfect, um, image of the feared vagina dentata, um, and things which uh, you know, if one looks at, at some of the correspondence between these guys later on, particularly the um, uh, the one about Dobbs, won't need to worry any longer about um, the tippity witch, given that he has a young one of his own, um, and in fact he'd married a, um, a, a teenager, basically. Um, and I was very amused to find, just, just by luck, um, a North American uh, carnivorous plant breeder who, who'd, uh, I think not, not even knowing McKinley's work, um, had um, named one of his, um, one of his, uh, the, the, the fly traps he'd bred, which was a green one, um, after um, the girl, the girl bride of Dobbs, um, because she, she, you know, she was uh, she was green and unripe. <laughs> so I think that was great, and, and um, I, I think that's regardless of whether whether, whether or not it, McKinley's argument is true, and I believe it is. I believe it it it, it holds water. Um, it it the the byplay of it. Um, does say something about um, about two things of 18th century botany. Um, first, that um, the the botanists were not above um, ribaldry in their in their work, um, just as the vernacular namers of plants have always used ribaldry um, in forming uh, names. Um, and secondly, it has a um, a rather intriguing sort of colonial undertone, possibly racial undertone as well, which um, I think is interesting. I wouldn't want to say more about that, except that it just floats in the background ever so slightly. You know, that this, uh, this, um, that you, you, you gave a, you gave a, a slightly made up indigenous Indian name to a rather vulgar plant.